If you haven't done so yet, please pause the video and try to solve the question before listening on. In the first question, we are being asked to calculate the mass of the steel bar after it was placed into the water. And in order to solve this question, we have to take advantage of the following concept. And that concept simply states that the total amount of heat that is gained within the system is going to equal the total amount of heat that is lost within the system. And to gain a better understanding of the difference between what is gaining heat and what is losing heat, we should go ahead and draw a picture of this steel rod present in the water. Now, we were told that the water has a temperature of 22 degrees Celsius and the steel rod is 2 degrees Celsius. And we know that heat will always travel from the warmer object to the cooler object. That is, from the object whose temperature is higher to the object whose temperature is lower. So we can see that because the water has a higher temperature, that heat will flow from the water to the steel rod. That means that the steel rod is gaining heat energy while the water will be losing heat energy. Now, we know from this chapter on thermochemistry that the amount of heat either gained or lost by an object as its temperature changes is equal to the mass of the object times its specific heat times the change in its temperature. So we're going to go ahead and fill in this expression for the Q of steel and also the Q of water. We have used subscripts of S for steel and W for water. Now we also know that the change in temperature of an object can be written as the final temperature minus the initial temperature. So we'll replace the delta T's with that expression. Now as we will see, we know every single term in the equation except for the mass of the steel bar, which again is exactly what we're looking for in the first question. So what we'll do is go ahead and plug in the specific heat of steel, the final and initial temperature of the steel, the mass of water, specific heat of water, and then the final and initial temperature of water. Now, we want to notice a couple of things about the numbers that we just plugged in. First of all, the question stated that the volume of water was 125 milliliters, but in the equation, we're supposed to be plugging in the mass of water. Now, it turns out, of course, one milliliter of water is equivalent to one gram of water. So what that means is if they say that the volume is 125 mils, we can confidently state that the mass of the water is 125 grams. So that's the mass that we've plugged in. Also, we want to notice for the change in temperature that for the steel, the value is going to be a positive change in temperature because it's absorbing heat. But for the water, it's actually going to turn out to be a negative change in temperature because it's losing heat. Now, of course, in math, we can't set a positive quantity equal to a negative quantity. That wouldn't make sense. So all we simply have to do is take the absolute value of the right-hand side of the equation. This will ensure that the amount of heat on the right-hand side will be a positive value and that will match the positive value of heat on the left-hand side of the equation. So what we'll do next is pick up our calculator and simplify the right-hand side. We can also simplify these two terms right here. And at this point, since we're looking to solve for the mass of the steel bar, we can divide both sides of the equation by the 8.7, and that will give us our answer. And we end up with approximately 41.9 grams. So this will be the correct answer to the first question. For the second question, we're being asked to calculate the molar heat capacity of water based on the specific heat of water. So what we'll do is simply write down the specific heat, and we will use the units that they gave us. So we'll have joules over grams times degrees Celsius. Now, the molar heat capacity of water is simply the number of joules per mole times degrees Celsius. So all we have to do is set up a conversion so that the grams will cancel out and leave us with moles in the denominator because we want, again, joules per mole degree Celsius. Now, for water, we know that 18 grams is present in one mole. And how do we know that? Well, we use the periodic table. We know the formula for water. We look up the molar mass of oxygen, which is 16. The molar mass of hydrogen is one, but there's two of them. So we would have a total of two for that mass. And then we add that together and that gives us the 18 grams per mole. So now all we have to do is cancel out the grams and we'll be left with joules per mole degree Celsius. And that's exactly the correct unit for molar heat capacity. 
and when we perform that multiplication, we get approximately 75.2 joules per mole times a degree Celsius. So this would be the correct answer to part two. Thanks for watching the video. If you liked it, click the thumbs up icon and subscribe so you can stay tuned for similar videos. Remember, you can send in your own question to the email address on the screen and I'll do my best to post an answer to it. And